The Battle for the Birds, Part 3. Chapter 18. The Unstoppable Twist. The terrors of the weekend ran through Terry's heart as he began the week. He spent most of his time out of the building. It was healthy to imagine himself rid of the problem and unconcerned. By Friday night, the transmitters were deeply engorged into Terry's home. They flew their lightning energies up to the bedroom corner above the door and he could only lace the walls together with aluminium and wallpaper in hope. He moved the small hallway table closer up toward the immersion side wall in an effort to trap the rising microwaves and the floor beneath the table was sealed with aluminium tape. The situation was tested continually with the fuses on or off. His back ached and his legs were completely shot with pain. It was time to look at the kitchen again. The horrendous signals that ran into the top of the flat near to the boiler were being partly absorbed by the heavy aluminium girder, balanced high between the boiler and the wall cupboard to its right. Some copernickel thread material had been squeezed into the box above the boiler itself where the flue exited. A rectangle of the polystyrene radiator preserver was folded to lie draped over the girder. A Faraday paper section was shoved loosely into the lower corner of the floor beneath the oak table. The area was a continual horror but Terry was certain that his additions were affecting the horse's plans. The sounds of discomfort from the flat below proved this. He moved the spare metal oven hood set on the wall cupboard to the right a little. Perhaps, thought Terry, things that appeared small to him were, in fact, causing drastic changes to Fox the intelligence that lay inside the tower. On Monday morning at 5 o'clock a.m., Terry was crouched near to the front door following the signal with his meter that was being directed in toward the side wall of the alcove box cupboard under the fuse box from under the floor. It was unending and powerful. This box housed the access point for the mains electricity supply and was such a prime target that Terry was confused as to how he could deal with it. He pushed foil into as much of the gap in the plastering that he found to the side of the wires and their casing. This was right at the front of the flat and the issues here were intense. It might be that much of it was explainable. After ramming the material into this unusual space, he left a long-reach screwdriver lodged into the position up in that corner of the box, twisting it to keep it in position. All the time that he worked on cleaning away the electric pollution, Terry was trying to decipher the cascade of dangerous numbers on the meter. The microwaves were compromising the design of the box. The gap behind the wall was the issue. Terry measured again and found vertical lines that ran up close to the wire's housing. They went up through the fuse box and into the ceiling light box. Every gap was an access point and Terry knew that to cut the signal's path he had to put various materials in them. As soon as he did this time, he knew that the transmitter beneath was immediately at work trying to find a better path of least resistance. He closed the box and was done. Almost unwillingly, he had dealt with much of the problem and he spent the rest of the day trying to forget the pull that the neighbor's equipment might be having upon his defenses. The invisible enemy could be felt every time that it returned, but Terry lived through the discomforts and, when the fresh clean air entered the flat, he knew that his enemies were readjusting their strategies. The purity of nature encouraged him on. By the next morning, the lines had overtaken much of the lounge. The serving hatch was again allowing a signal through to fly out and back across the room to hit the top of the socket's chase near to the computer table. The downstairs occupants were casting their lines in the reverse direction to the mast signal. This was an anemina that Terry had already seen but it always surprised him and he had to include it in his calculations but it still made him freeze in quiet contemplation. He knew the truth was that his body had been subjected to the damaging microwaves from every side for such a long time and the attempts had been impertinent, underhand, and unexplained for at least seven years. Now the dreadful strategy had been uncovered. The sliding panel in the serving hatch was alive with voltage. The glass was already covered with film and tape, but the beams flew through the gap. The panel was moved to the side and then he went back to the computer wall to seal the top of the chase with as much material and Faraday paper as he deemed necessary. Having completed the exercise the messages persisted but it seemed to be a losing battle. Inside the immersion cupboard, Terry put down more foil to the wood floor before he readjusted the Chinese fabric which acted as a cover. 
the chicken wire was locked into a much higher position in the corner and, lastly, he pulled down the aluminium bubble wrap from its position stuck to the inside wall and placed it under the carpet to the left of the piano in the lounge. Here was another transmitter that rose up through the doorway to strike the hallway lighting. The front door area was looked at again. Here, Terry found that the signals had found new ways to enter so more aluminium was stuffed into the gaps in the box. The gap that was right up at the front of the flat under the mains cable entry was awash with electric pollution so he adjusted his filling attempts until the reappearing side signal was driven away. Perhaps he was gaining ground. Even so, the future was untested. Perhaps the outcome would more luminous than Terry could predict. In reality, he found out that he could not find the the concluding moves in the studio that day and work was a struggle. The next afternoon, Terry took a sheet of radiator preserver away from the studio side wall, shaved it free of polystyrene and reattached it with paste. After checking the effect, another piece was attached and wallpaper was stuck high up in ruffled style up in the corners of the window alcove. The field around the music stand became too much to bear and Terry could not secure his sanity. He put the sphinx back on the window sill. Even if he knew that it had little effect there, it was an attempt. He then turned his mind to the bedroom problems. The wiring in the loft was being accessed from beneath the doorpost nearest to the mast side wall. The gap between it and the wall, which was millimeters thin, was filled with unsafe radiation that flew up vertically. The stream was measured at nearly one microtesla and as such, Terry knew that this was many times the level which would affect his physical being. At the back of his mind, he had known that something had been was wrong for some time and now the unsettling nature of the room had an explanation. After a few seconds he knew what to do. Some paste was mixed up with with snippings of the ferrous wallpaper to make a potpourri which Terry used to patch all the way up the gap. Toward the top of the running vertical line he fixed in some chicken wire to rinse the voltages out. Once he had finished pushing the wet paper together into a slug shape at the top of the frame he measured once more. He was still taking strong readings toward the ceiling, but whether this meant that the signals were just being compromised or that he had struck it lucky was still an unanswered question. His mind was dealing with the new facts that the transmitters were rising through the flat like a bed of nails. In the lounge, the extra aluminium under the skirting beneath the wall sockets was quite possibly working. He gave it a test, looking at every possible line. There was enough there to stop many of the diagonal signals. The rising beams could have been tacking into the other side of the wall where the bedroom wall light fixture lay. Next door, where the beams shot into the high bedroom corner nearest to the window, a wallpaper barrier was fixed in that hung in a rectangle from the ceiling and a piece of nickel-twisted fabric was attached to hopefully absorb much of the angled terror before it hit the wallpaper barrier. The univited electro-intrusions were still apparent at the bedroom door on Wednesday and the wood tiles that had been removed from between the doorposts of the studio were stripped of their bitumen bases. The long-reach screwdriver was removed from the small plaster gap near the mains cable in the front door alcove box. He found more of the gap and rammed it full with wallpaper and aluminium before the screwdriver was put back into position for good measure. Next to the boiler in the kitchen was still a live area so a large patch of wallpaper was pasted onto the wall nearest to the serving hatch. Everything was checked to make sure that the voltages were being correctly led out to the wall and then down into the copper water pipes. It looked like he was driving the incoming signals away to make the area safer. The small wall between the serving hatch and the boiler fast became a wallpaper covered area and the thick aluminium tape dissuaded the mast from using it. The meter ran around the 0.35 microtesla mark. This was enough below the bubble level to fail. He looked to the right of the boiler. Everything had been put into place and there was no other way. The chicken wire, heavy aluminium girder, ceiling protections, painted wall, and wallpaper. They all served a purpose in dissolving whatever was hitting the other side of the room. As Terry confused his surrounders with more issues to deal with, the noises continued from underneath. As soon as he had started work on the skirting underneath the front lounge wall, the knocks and readjustments from the horse and family could clearly be located. Every corner was scraped. To the left of the door. Under the piano. 
There were at least six pieces of equipment, let alone the huge cables that Terry imagined were joining the octopus-like contraptions. As he worked on the skirting under the side lounge wall he heard the knocks over in other corners. He immediately took measurements of the diagonal rays. The room was a box of needles and every line was intent and glass sharp. Terry hid away until the flat returned itself to a voltage in the air that could be regarded as normal. A crow and blackbird could be seen dashing up to the roof on the corner of the other block. In the evening, the blackbird returned to the yew tree and the robin sang out in the channel. Terry took time away from the keyboard to watch the seagulls constantly fly past. They had all the space of the darkening sky. Terry linked the willing over of his ears to the switching off of the fuses. The only remaining live circuit was the kitchen and even if the lighting circuit was still being accessed in the studio, the 0.08T reading that stayed in the air even when all the fuses were off was less and less concerning to Terry. He scrunched up a ball of bubble wrap and pushed it in directly underneath the gas meter. At night, Terry lifted the carpet at the side of the bed. He needed to lay some fabric out under the bedroom light fixture. There were lines going up the wall at a 33 degrees angle into the light or up into the corner crevices. Terry went to the lounge and turned around the half-length of plasterboard connector between the light fixture on the wall and the window rail so that the hooked part fitted over the light fitment. He tucked the Swiss shield in behind the picture on the garden side lounge wall. Like a moth on the net curtain, he was just there that Saturday morning. If it wasn't him it would be someone else. The flat and its situation was in command and he was a mere player. Generations of moths into the future would find the same lodging at this particular time of year. Normality was seemingly beckoning him onwards but the weirdness was winning. He still felt as if he was in two minds. Terry just wanted them gone. On a mid-April Sunday, the bedroom seemed safe but Terry's ears had already become walled. Then he went to his safe space in the studio and the familiar de-clicking began. When he felt less sick, Terry tested the immersion cupboard. He ran the meter across the wiring, pipes and tank and found the high-energy microwaves that were all over the place. The heating circuit was switched off from the fuse box. Terry wondered if the boiler tank itself was a receiver but the thought led him away from being in command so he let it lie. During the morning, he took some time out from composing to stuff more materials under the skirting of the lounge immersion side wall and under the front window. Wallpaper strips and aluminium were getting close to covering the whole of the room's perimeter. From his bed, Terry could hear the noises of discomfort from below. He went to the immersion cupboard to connect the top pipe to the bottom. Back to check the meter in the bedroom. It flickered in discomfort. The chicken wire in the immersion cupboard was pushed to fit more tightly between the pipes. A sheet of radiator preserver was placed on its side on the shelf and the static filter was moved into the socket adapter. He tested all over and it was unclear but he found pipes that registered zero. Terry turned the lighting circuit off and left the flat.